and he has received awards from the World Affairs Council of Oregon, Ecumenical Ministries, Humanitarian, and Oregon Peace Institute Awards. And then we have <laughs> Jelani Greenidge, who isn't quite here yet. He's on his way. He should be here very shortly, but I will give you his bio. He's a versatile communicator. He's a pastor, a writer, a hip-hop MC producer, and a DJ and a stand-up comic. And his bio says that he informs, inflames, and inspires. He serves nationally as a missional storyteller for the Evangelical Covenant Church and a worship pastor of the Access Covenant Church. He is a published author, and his latest book is Undercover, Undercover Prophets, Pursuing the Stand-Up Comedy to Talk About What Matters Most. So uh, with that, I'm going to also introduce our very wonderful pastor, the Reverend Cynthia McBride, who will be our moderator. Thank you, Joni. What a privilege it is to work with the social justice team here at First Christian Church. Thank you all for coming today. On the table in front of you, you will notice that there are three by five cards and a couple of pens. I encourage you to use those throughout the session of the presentation by the panelists to write down questions. Our format today is that we will have each panelist speak for up to 20 minutes. They have been allotted that time to use as they choose to share with us. And then after all three panelists have finished their presentations, we will have a question and answer time, and we will be using your written questions at that time um, to make sure we don't have a, a duplication of comments. So I encourage you to be writing questions and comments as they come to you during the presentation. We are intentionally seeking a diversity of perspectives and opinions throughout this forum series. So there may be a perspective you hear presented that is different than your own. That is a blessing. We encourage you to be open to hearing new ideas, and we are anticipating respect for one another throughout the forum series. <sighs> welcome. It is a joy and an honor to welcome our three panelists with us. Um, I have been in text conversation with Jelani, and he's on his way. He was helping to lead worship this morning. So when you ask a pastor to do a Sunday afternoon presentation, it takes them a little bit of time to get here. The good thing is we have planned our format to have him be the third speaker, so he will arrive as the panel is presuming. Peggy and Frank, would you go ahead and come forward? I will be the timekeeper. We're going to begin with Peggy Nagai, and then Frank will follow, um, and then Jelani. As I said, each individual will have about 20 minutes for their presentation. They have been invited to begin by sharing just a little bit of their own background, cultural context, life perspective to help you know them a tad beyond the formal biographies that Jenny has read for us. And then we have asked specifically for their input on the current question of democracy in America. They may be talking about either historical or family experiences related to voting access, to challenges of engaging and participating fully in American democracy in 2024. They have the freedom to share with us issues that they are passionate about that relate to the context of this forum presentation. So I'm going to go ahead and be seated and let Penny begin and I'll wave it to you when it's about 20 minutes and then we'll move on to Frank. Thanks. Well, thank you everybody uh, for this opportunity to speak with you today. I wanted to say to, to Pastor Cynthia that I really appreciate it. Can you all hear? Is the mic okay? Really appreciate it. Uh, being in the worship service this morning uh, and your vision and spirit 
spiritualness and spiritual pragmatism as well. I want to thank uh, Joni Kimoto. Joni is, I'm sure, beloved and cherished in this uh, in this context, but she is a beloved and cherished uh, elder in the Japanese American community. So thank you, Jen, Joni. And Elizabeth, who I just met this morning, thank you for the work that you two are doing. Uh, you see that Elizabeth is wearing red, white, and blue today, which is great, and her earrings. And I went to the manicures yesterday and got blue nails. Uh, <laughs> so just a, a bit about my background. I was uh, born in Portland, but raised in Boring, Oregon. And I'm sure all of you have been there, right? <laughs> OK. Because when I introduce myself out of state, they think it's an adjective for the state of Oregon. <laughs> and I have to disabuse them of that fact. That no, it's a proper noun, and the boring, you know, Mr. Boring was my bus driver, and Mrs. Boring was a school secretary, and Jim Boring was in my brother's class, and I can go on and on about the boring. <laughs> um, so I'm a third generation Japanese American. My grandparents immigrated um, in the early 1900s. My parents were second generation Nisei, and uh, all of my relatives and uh, those who were born, I was not born uh, before World War II, but they were all incarcerated um, during World War II, and that really has informed my um, vision, conviction, passion, and career. Um, I was talking to Sally Leisure, who's over there in the pink. Sally and I have known each other since 1977, when I graduated from law school and we were at Legal Aid together. But uh, I started out my career wanting to be a, a poverty lawyer, because I grew up in poverty. Um, we didn't have indoor plumbing. We ate government surplus food in the winter. Uh, and the whole idea of the model minority, right, the middle class, upper class, was not my experience. My experience of poverty is the way that we got out of it is through education. And so my mother said, the, the far, if farm work is too hard, get your education and get off the farm. And the combination of her saying that and uh, their experience, uh, and going to Vassar College. And uh, I went to Vassar at a time when there were no Japanese American farm girls from Boring, Oregon, who grew up poor <laughs> at Vassar. Um, so I would say that I was part of their affirmative action program, and I was really proud to be a, an affirmative action person. Um, I, I was listening to Michelle Obama's speech again, uh, from the DNC, and she said, um, we don't have affirmative, we, some of us do not have the experience of having affirmative action of intergenerational wealth. Um, and so that word has, that term has been used in many, many different contexts. Um, but it was really at Vassar that I learned how to think. It was really there when I was um, in my, between my junior and senior year and was a waitress in Lake Placid, New York. Has anybody been to Lake Placid? Okay, two people. It was the White Face Inn, and you, you've been to the White Face Inn? <laughs> All right, maybe I served you, no. Um, but back then, and that was 1972, um, the African Americans had segregated, we were all employees, they had segregated eating and living quarters at the White Face Inn. Uh, and the, um, the waitress, we got paid by the number of people we served uh, at any meal. But the number of people we served at any meal was uh, decided by the maitre d'. And some of us had two people and some of us had 12 people. And so like a good ambassador grad, uh, I said, let's strike. We need to strike as waitresses because they are being unfair. So we went, my friend and I went to the maitre d' one last time and said, um, this is what we want to do. We think it's unfair. It should be more equitable. Uh, and he said, why are you two complaining? You get a lot of guests. Yes, we do, but that's not the point. The point is equity, not capitalism at the dinner table. Um, so he said, well, 
as waitresses, you have no labor laws that protect you. We could fire you tomorrow and get a whole new crew in. Um, and besides, our board of directors is composed of 11 lawyers from New York City. Now, I've never even met a lawyer. I mean, I was from Boring. Uh, I didn't go east of Idaho until I went to Vassar. But I said to myself, if lawyers are that powerful, I'm gonna go to law school for social justice. And um, that's one of the reasons, and with my parents, that I went, um, went to Lewis and Clark and graduated from Lewis and Clark, and my first job was at Legal Aid, where I knew Sally. Uh, so a little bit about my background. Let me tell you, um, you know, I, I am here to kind of set the stage of the history um, I use the history because the question is voting rights for the Japanese American community. And voting rights for, for them was not existent until the 50s. But the history of the United States is one of exclusion. Uh, the Act of 1790 said that it limited US citizenship to white immigrants in effect to people from Western Europe who resided in the US at least two years and their children. It was the states that said you had to be white, male, and property owners. So it wasn't um, all white immigrants. So if you want to know why we here, are here today in 2024 with the issues that we are dealing with today in this election and at this time in our country, we need to look back at our history. We need to understand from its very beginning, it was not considered a multicultural, multiracial country. It was a white country that, that was created by white immigrants who, um, have, who stole the land from Native Americans. And until we can really face that history and accept that history and heal from that history, we are not going to be able to create a multiracial, inclusive democracy. It is the healing and the strength and the looking at it and the reconciliation of that that gives us the power to do something different. So rather than avoiding, let's really talk about that history. In Oregon, as probably you know, many of you know, I'm sure you know, uh, Oregon's racially exclusionary laws started pretty early on. Like when the Constitution, the Oregon Constitution was passed that uh, prohibited blacks, Chinese, and mulattoes from voting. Yeah. At the time, there were 450 Chinese in the whole state, but they were still excluded in the Constitution, the state Constitution, from voting. So a year later, the Oregon was the first state admitted to the Union with an exclusionary law written into its Constitution. And in 1862, Oregon passed a law that said that blacks, Chinese, Hawaiians, and mulattoes residing in the state must pay an annual tax of $5. If they failed to do that, they would be pressed into service to maintain roads for 50 cents a day. Uh, in 1866, marriage between whites and persons with a quarter or more of Negro blood, Chinese, Native Hawaiians, and Native Americans was prohibited. I wonder how many Native Hawaiians were here in 1866, what do you think? I can't imagine. Um, <clears throat> in 1880, the first uh, immigrants from Japan came to the U.S., uh, a woman, Mio, Iwa Koshi and her brother Ricky and her daughter Tama. Her partner was an Australian professor, Andrew McKinnon, who opened a mill near Gresham. Do you know the area called Orient? Orient, Oregon? That is, that is because they settled there. So there's a reason why that was called, that is called, was called Orient. He passed away later, but she settled, stayed, and thrived in Oregon. <clears throat> and you all probably know that in 1920, the 19th Amendment cleared the way for most black and white 
women to vote. Do you all know that? So, but not all white women could vote. In fact, uh, if you're an American-born woman who married an immigrant uh, who was foreign-born and not naturalized, they were prohibited from voting. And then in 19, uh, after 1922, an, an American-born woman couldn't vote if she had married an Asian immigrant. So that was specific uh, to the United States, but it also very, very much upheld in Oregon. Um, and no Japanese Americans could vote because in order to vote, you had to be a, a citizen and they couldn't become naturalized citizens. In 1920, both the Oregon Senate and the State of Representatives unanimously adopted a proposal that encouraged the alteration of the 14th Amendment. Of the, of the Constitution, so that American-born children of immigrants would be ineligible for citizenship. So the children of uh, American-born children, so we, we assume that if you're born in the U.S., you are by birth a citizen, right? And this is the, at least the state of Oregon trying to stop that from happening. So we also at Oregon have a particular history, I think, that, that behooves us to heal from, to both realize that has been our history, but it doesn't have to be our future. That it was then, but it doesn't have to be now and in the future. Um, in the 1920s, as you probably know, there was a surge of power from the Ku Klux Klan. The KKK would see as many as 25,000 members among its ranks alone by the end of the decade. And the Klan members were not just the rural poor, but were state legislators, local government officials, members of law enforcement, and influential business people. So, and I know that Norm is back there somewhere, right? Or was. Um, but the idea sometimes that we think that the Klan was made up of uneducated, not sophisticated individuals is not true. And it's not true in Oregon. Again, this is not to tell the history to shame people. It's to tell the history so we can live into it, live up to it, and live beyond it. Does that make sense to you? Because yeah. if we don't know that history, we are doomed to repeat it. Um, and so that's why I want us to know this history and understand it. Their violent hatred, the KKK, often associated with attacks on, on those who are, who are black, Jewish, and Catholic, were also aimed towards Japanese and other Asian Americans. They found their power when Governor Walter Pierce became governor in 1922. He also served as a U.S. Uh, representative of Oregon in Congress and was among the most vocal and vitriolic bigots against Japanese Americans, not just in Oregon, but in the country at large. So there are two uh, Supreme Court cases that were instrumental in Asian Americans uh, Japanese Americans and uh, South Asian Indian Americans. One was in 1922, Ozawa versus United States. Ozawa was Japanese American, lived in Hawaii, had been in the U.S. for 22 years, was a Christian, went to church, went to school, very fair skin. And what he said, he argued, was that whiteness depended upon skin color. And because his skin was pale, he argued he should be be granted citizenship. So his case uh, he lost in Hawaii, he lost in the Ninth Circuit, it went up to the Supreme Court, and Justice George Sutherland uh, wrote the opinion, but it was a unanimous court. Justice Sutherland himself was an immigrant from Britain who became a naturalized citizen. The Supreme Court unanimously denied Ozawa citizenship, saying that the that saying that whiteness only extended to the Caucasian race. 
So it wasn't about the color of your skin, it was about your racial identity. And the Oregonian, which had previously advocated for Japanese naturalization within the state, fell in line with the ruling and abandoned the cause. And the, the other, well, oh, the, the other uh, uh, US Supreme Court cases was um, Thin, who in 1923, an Indian Sikh man who identified himself as a high caste Hindu of full Indian blood, uh, but also identified himself as Aryan. And essentially, and he said, because I am Aryan and considered Aryan, um, by certain national government organizations, I should be, I should have the right to become a naturalized citizen. The Supreme Court said that you can be Aryan, you can be called Caucasian, but it doesn't make you white. And what they meant by that is, and what they actually said was, there's a common sense definition of white a common sense definition of white. And we have that conversation now. What the heck is a common sense definition of white? I mean, we may or may not know that, but that's what the court held in 1923. So by ruling that Ozawa and Finn were non-white, the Supreme Court rendered them as non-citizens and irrevocably foreign. It, together, these cases illustrate the social construct of race and whiteness. I mean, we know that race is a social construct. Struck. Here's how the highest court in the country uses that social construct, construct uh, to manipulate and to deny naturalization rights to Asian immigrants. And you ask why? Why did this happen? And we need to go back to the history to say that there are fears rooted in racist beliefs among white Americans that immigrants from Asia would undermine the economy and th threaten white racial purity. And I'm fortunate to say that the churches also were helpful, were supportive, were really talking about manifest destiny and who has a right to own this land and be called Americans. And so coming to a, um, I was raised a conservative Southern Baptist in Boring, Oregon, so I was a Boring Baptist. Uh, and um, it, was, it was hard being, uh, growing up in a very, very Southern white religion. Um, so, the other things that happened in Oregon was by 1923, the Klan was instrumental in the legislature. There were many, many legislators who were um, Klan members, and also this is a time when Walter Pierce was overtly supportive of the Klan and supported their agenda. So three things happened. An, a an alien land law was passed in Oregon in 1923 that said if you're ineligible to become a citizen, you're ineligible to own land. So you see how they hooked the right to become a citizen with the right to own land. And what they also said was that municipalities, if you're ineligible to become a citizen, they can refuse you business licenses. And then they started to do something that I think uh, some people want to do. They started they passed a law that said, we need to keep track of where these Japanese and Asian immigrants live. And so we're gonna have the counties um, keep track of who is in their county of Asian descent and who, what Asian, Japanese and Chinese residents owned or leased land. So they were keeping track of them. Um, so all of that combined that in 1924, the U.S. Congress passed the Immigration Law of 1924, which uh, essentially prohibited any immigration from, from Asia. So it stopped the immigration, and really it stopped until 1965. But in 1943, 
uh, Warren Magnuson of Washington introduced a bill that said that Chinese immigrants could become naturalized citizens. Do you know why? 1943. World War II. World, World War II. And because China was an ally to the US, then Chinese immigrants could become naturalized citizens. And that's another part of this entire history, which is the countries of our origin and their political relationships with the US make a difference on how Asian Americans are perceived and viewed. So the example, you know, there's been a lot, an increase of anti-Asian hate in this country. Do you, did you know that? And do you know when it started, the most recent time that it started? COVID. And why COVID? Because the president of this country called it the China virus and Kung flu and repeated that and repeated that and repeated that. So you have incidents of white Americans saying to Asian Americans, go back to where you come, came from. You brought this virus with you. You are creating this problem. And there's so many of our elders that were struck down, that were hit, um, that, that faced the terror when you're older of not feeling physically safe. So in 1946, extended, the US extended the opportunity for citizenship to Filipino and Indian Americans, but it wasn't until 1952 and my grandparents came in the early 1900s. Five decades later, in 1952, when Congress passed the McCarran-Walter Act, that Korean and Japanese immigrants were deemed eligible to become naturalized citizens with the right to vote. Uh, and truly, broad access to American citizenship and voting rights was not available to Asians and Asian Americans until the immigration and National Nationality Act of 1952 and 1965. It's when the Voting Rights Act was passed. Uh, effectively ending two centuries of restrictions and legal disenfranchisement. Okay, I've said my piece at least for this part. And I will hand it back to you. So. Peggy, thank you so much for that detailed overview of a significant part of the history of this country that helps us understand the current context in which we're living and what some of our fellow citizens um, continue to bear the brunt of today. It's very helpful for us to know that that background is part of this conversation. We're now going to turn for a different perspective to Mr. Frank Afranji. Thank you, Reverend Clyde, and uh, thank you, Joni, for organizing this. As uh, Dr. Reverend Page says, I'm not why God didn't wire me for voice, so I'm going to be close to the microphone here. And thank you, Rodney, for always uh, allowing the opportunity to speak at uh, this type of uh, uh, meetings. Uh, Patty, uh, your presentation was amazing. Uh, I really had no idea about the details of this. I know Oregon specifically had a lot of history of discrimination, so uh, your presentation was very illuminating. Um, for those of you who have uh, never met, uh, my name is Frank Fawaz Afrangi. I was born in the Palestinian city of Ramallah. Uh, I came here at the age of 18. Uh, my parents, uh, my mom was born in Jerusalem, and she can trace her family's history uh, to about 900 years back. Wow. And my father was born in Gaza, but lived all of his life uh, in, uh, well, not all of his life, a good chunk of his life in Jaffa, which is south of Tel Aviv, until in 1948, he, my mother, and my older siblings were forced to leave with their pajamas on, on a little boat to Egypt, and then went to Jordan, 
and then went back to the West Bank where I was born. Uh, I was asked to give you a little bit of a background of my history and where I come from. Uh, basically, I'll, I'll just relate to you uh, one incident at the age of uh, about 13, which really colored the path of my uh, history. Uh, in 1967, that's how I was, how old I was, and uh, uh, that's when the uh, six war, uh, six day war occurred. And uh, so we, our uh, main uh, house was uh, uh, close to the highway between Jerusalem and Ramallah, and it got uh, shelled pretty bad. So we had to. Uh, evacuate and live with the family up uh, a little bit high on a close by mountain. About a, a week into the occupation uh, by the Israeli forces, uh, an Israeli patrol came uh, around and uh, ordered all males about the age of 10 to congregate in the soccer field. Well, uh, in 1956, something like this happened in Gaza, and uh, they shot many people and killed them. So the ladies of the neighborhood uh, asked, uh, 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 got together and decided to uh, send all the male uh, sons to Jordan. And uh, it turned out they didn't kill anybody, they just wanted to give them ideas so that uh, anybody who wasn't there at the time wouldn't be allowed back. But on the way to Jordan, uh, we uh, they basically uh, paid uh, a taxi driver uh, an obscene amount of money uh, to get us to Jordan because at the time it was very dangerous. On the way, uh, we came upon a Palestinian civil uh, a car that an Israeli uh, G, uh, tank had rolled over and the arms of a little kid was sticking out of that window. Uh, I stopped, we stopped for a second to see if there was anybody alive. I mean, there was dead, of course, but at that moment I made a promise to myself, which I kept to this day, that I will never support violence by anybody. It doesn't matter who it is. So that's really what colored my, the path of my life. Uh, so this is some of the history of, uh, of uh, where I come from and who I am. Uh, the question at hand here is what is the impact and what are the voting issues uh, that we are facing within our community? I'd just like to give you a little uh, uh, preview of the numbers of Arab Americans and Muslim Americans in the United States. A lot of people conflate Arab Americans with Muslim Americans as one and the same. Well, the majority of Arab Americans in the US are Christian Americans, believe it or not, from Palestine, from Lebanon, from other areas. There is about uh, close to four million Arab Americans. Uh, a lot of them uh, came back in the 1920s. Uh, some were from Yemen to work in, uh, the, in Michigan and the uh, auto industry. And there were several waves, uh, depending on uh, uh, wars and what have you, in the United States. Muslim Americans, there is about 5 million Muslim Americans in the United States. Now, uh, most Arab Americans and, and uh, Muslim Americans were split among the two major parties, no different than uh, typical uh, any American citizen for a long time. You had people who were on the Republican side, some were on the uh, Democratic side, until uh, there was a major shift uh, Pretty much at the time of uh, Senator Mark Hatfield, for all of you who remember, many of the Arab Americans in Oregon were Republicans. And uh, uh, as uh, you recall, Senate, uh, Governor Atiyah, who was an Arab American, who was a Republican. But then uh, we ended up with uh, 
the contract of America or contract on America with the likes with the likes of uh, Gingrich and uh, followed by Ted Cruz and followed by uh, many many the Republican Party shifted drastically to be anti-immigrant, anti-non-white, anti-anti-anti-anti. And all of a sudden, the majority of Arab Americans and, uh, uh, and uh, Muslim Americans tended to move towards the Democratic Party. And so in the last uh, few elections, uh, the vast majority of Arab and Muslim Americans voted Democratic. This year is totally different. Oh, and, and, and uh, by the way, please, uh, when we get about three minutes or so of, uh, of uh, my talk, uh, let me know because I, I tend to keep going on. <laughs> so um, this year is very different. Uh, what has occurred that is changing the way Arab and Muslim Americans feel? First of all, they feel extremely disenfranchised, and I'll explain why. The war in Gaza and what followed in Gaza of, uh, unfortunately, the support of this administration of a massive amount of genocide, of a massive around, uh, amount of sending weapons, of vast, vast amount of diplomatic cover to the most extreme elements within Israel. Uh, you have a, a government in Israel that advocates uh, clearly, openly, uh, the, uh, uh, this uh, basically ethnic cleansing of Palestinians aside uh, from the apartheid uh, that uh, the Palestinian people in the occupied areas and even within Israel experience every day. Uh, so uh, there was a lot of uh, requests or, uh, for, for the administration uh, to basically try to be a little bit even handed to stop sending uh, a, a, an extreme amount of uh, our tax dollars and our most lethal weapons to Israel. And we, uh, as our community would hear it, basically, oh, we would like it to, whoops, we would like to de-escalate. We, I'm sorry, it goes right into my hearing aids. <laughs> uh, it's like, you know, in one second. This is actually a boss of mine from about 30 years ago. I don't know why he's calling. Um, so, uh, Basically, uh, we would hear uh, comments from the administration that uh, we would like a ceasefire. Uh, by the way, here is another $7 billion worth of weapons to Israel. We would like to de-escalate, de-escalate by escalating. Here is another $15 billion and 2,000 two uh, uh, pound bombs to Israel. The result was, uh, where my father was born, first of all, uh, early in the process, I lost 18 members of my family. In one wow. incident, a family of seven members, mom, dad, and their siblings, were wiped out of the registry. Every, every pretty much school, every hospital, you're talking about an area of uh, two million people who have been concentrated in a 17 by 10 mile stretch of the world, the most dense area in the world. They have decimated, brought down to the ground, 95% of the residences. They're either damaged or completely destroyed. They have, every single hospital is, has been uh, to some extent damaged or destroyed. There was a call for starving the people, making them die out of thirst, openly, openly within the Israeli, uh, 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 if you will, government. 
And uh, again, it's a government that is, has been the most extreme in Israel's history, most extreme, openly calling for the annexation of the West Bank, the occupied territories. As a matter of fact, even some elements now are openly talking about Lebanon being a nice place to build settlements. So it, what our community was dumbfounded that here is uh, a, an administration that literally got into office because of our vote. And why do I say that? Because most Arab Americans are concentrated in crucial states, critical states, like Michigan, Pennsylvania, Virginia, and even California. And guess what? Biden won those states by the slimmest of the margins. And, and uh, if the Arab American vote weren't there for him, we would have had the pleasure of having Mr. Trump in the last five years. Pleasure for some. Um, well, that's not the only thing that's really uh, why, why would the administration, why would the administration be ignoring uh, the voters' voice? Uh, many uh, survey after survey of uh, uh, folks in this country have asked for a ceasefire. Uh, survey after survey uh, in this country are opposed to apartheid and ethnic cleansing in Palestine, Israel. So why would the administration and many of our legislators uh, 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 play along, uh, send our legal weapons and our tax dollars and give diplomatic cover to a, com to a country at this stage that is, stands 100% opposing to our views of the world, human rights, equal rights, uh, on and on and on. The reason being, uh, we have a lovely thing called Citizens United uh, that was uh, passed by the Supreme Court, which allows dark money to enter our, into our voting system. What does that mean? It means that uh, billionaires and, and others and other companies can contribute phenomenal amount of dollars uh, to get somebody to vote, be voted in or voted out. Examples, the owner of the Venetian, a fellow who just passed away, uh, uh, Sheldon Adelson, and his wife, Miriam Adelson, promised Trump $100 million if they, he would follow what their requests to move the embassy to East Jerusalem, which is the Palestinian section of town, take it over. Uh, deny the Palestinians, uh, they, they, they close the U.S. Council in East Jerusalem, which served as an embassy for the pa uh, Palestine, for the occupied areas, and so on and so forth. And guess what? Uh, APAC, American Israel Public Affairs, and other lobbying groups, they are extremely effective at brainwashing our voters into voting what, on whatever uh, they want. And I'll give you an example. Here in Oregon, we, they, they don't come and say this uh, uh, contribution is being done by the American Israel public efforts. They don't say that. They come up with such names as uh, 